know, magic doesn't have to be done with big props or on a large scale to be amazing. It doesn't even have to be done with special items. I'm going to do something that I think is a miracle with just a regular styrofoam cup, a pencil, and some water. Watch. I'm going to pour the water into the cup. And I've poured it like this so you can see that it went into the cup. I take the pencil. Stick it in the cup, and water's gone. Hi, I'm Joel Phantom. I've been doing magic for 24 years. I think it's a great form of entertainment and a wonderful hobby for anybody. Let me show you what I mean about magic. This is a trick with four coins, in this case quarters, and four regular playing cards. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to cover each of the coins with a card. Now do you remember the coin that was here? I say was because it's not here anymore. It's over here. Do you remember the one that was here? Well now it's over here. Remember the coin that was here? not here anymore, it's over here. Now I'd like to introduce Holly Ray. Hi, Holly. Hi. And Holly's going to be watching me do more magic like this, smaller magic, which is known as close-up magic. Now, Holly, what I'd like to show you here is a rod with six colors on the front and the same six colors on the back. Now, what I'd like you to do is pick a number between one and six. Two. Two? All right, T-W-O. So you've picked the orange color. Now remember, six colors on the front, six on the back. Now Holly's going to say the magic words, which are? Hocus pocus. And the magic rod has changed to orange on the front and orange on the back. Now that's magic. Now I'd like to show you one of the oldest tricks in magic, the cups and balls. This trick was first believed to have been performed 2500 BC. Now I use aluminum cups and they are solid as you can see. Now what I'm going to do is make a ball pass through this cup instantly, faster than you can say the magic words. Watch. Just that quick. Now I'm going to make it go through two cups, both solid, just as fast. Watch. Now I'm going to show you something really special with the cups and balls. I'm going to put one ball in front of each of the three cups. And I'm going to slide that ball under its respective cup, as you can see that I'm doing here. Now, say the magic words, please. Pocus, pocus. And there's no balls on the outside cups, and all three are in the middle. The cups and balls done with three cups and three balls. Now I'd like to teach you how to do some magic. The first thing I'm going to teach you is a trick known as the coin flight. Two quarters, and watch, I'm going to put one in this hand, and I'm going to put one over in this hand. So we have one coin in each hand. I wiggle my fingers, and I say the magic words. Hocus pocus. Hocus. And there's nothing over here, and both coins are over here. Now I'm going to show you how to do this trick. First, I take this coin in the right hand, and I put it in the left. But that's only an illusion. There's nothing in the left hand. The coin's in the right hand. And how I do this is I perform something magicians call a retention pass. That's where I clip this coin with my thumb and retain it in this hand as I pass it to the other hand. Now, if you didn't do that, the coin would legitimately fall in this hand. This is very simple to do. All you do is you hold the coin with your thumb as you act like you're putting it in your left hand. Now all that remains to be done is pick up the other coin with your two free fingers of the right hand you twiddle your thumbs, say the magic words, all that is showmanship, which is part of what makes magic so entertaining. There's nothing over here, and the two coins are over here. Now I'd like to show you a trick based on that principle, because once you know a magic principle, you can apply it to a number of tricks. I'm going to take this quarter, and I'm going to rub it on my arm. And the rubbing creates friction. Friction makes heat, and heat melts metal, and the coin will just disappear. It'll disappear if I can hang on to it. 
Well, watch the coin, Holly. And it's gone. It's a pretty good trick, except what do you do about the hand, right? <laughs> you show it empty. <laughs> the coin's totally vanished. Now, you know, normally I'd pull the coin out of somebody's ear, but I don't do that because I don't know where their ears have been. But I will pull it out of my ear. See the hand's empty? And watch. The coin returns by magic. Now, this seems amazing, but it's simple to do. First, you pick up the coin with the free hand, and you rub it on your elbow. This is to establish that the coin is in that hand. You drop it on purpose, even though it appears to be an accident, and you pick up the coin with your right hand, and that is so you can perform the retention pass. You just hold it with your thumb and give the illusion of putting it in your left hand. Then you take the coin and you put it up on your collar. But all the time you look at the hand where the coin's supposed to be, not where it is. That's known as misdirection. And you rub the hand on your elbow and move it away. Now, the audience thinks the coin is here. They think you've just palmed it. And you acknowledge what they're supposedly thinking, saying, yeah, it's a pretty good trick, but what do you do about the hand? You show it empty. Now all that's left to be done is just to make the coin reappear from your ear because it's sitting up in your collar anyway. And that's the coin from elbow vanish. Now, if you need to practice a retention pass more than I've shown it here, just rewind the tape and look at it again and again till you get it down pat. The next thing I'd like to show you is a card trick. If you're going to do magic, you need to know at least one card trick. And this is a good one. If this is the only card trick you know, you'll know a good one. It involves the four kings and a regular deck of cards. You show the four kings and the deck that they belong to. You place the kings on top. Nothing tricky there, right, Holly? Right. All right, now I'm going to place one of the kings on the bottom, one in the middle, and one on the top. And we'll leave this last king, the fourth king, over here in a corner, and he'll wait for his brother kings to return. Tap the deck three times, and sure enough, the kings return to the top by magic. Pretty good, huh? Pretty good. But it's easy to do. See, what you do is when you're thumbing through the deck looking for the kings, by the way, you can set this up in front of people. They won't know what you're doing because you've got the back of the cards to them. As you find the kings, you place them on the bottom of the deck until you have all four kings. Then you thumb them off into your free hand along with three other cards. So you actually have seven cards in your hand. And then when you fan the kings, once again with the backs to the audience, you fan them in such a way that the three other cards don't show. So when you show your audience the four kings, they think that's all you have. And you place them on top of the deck. Now what's actually on top is the three other cards. And those are the ones that you place at the bottom, in the middle, and near the top of the deck. And the last king is placed over here. You tap the deck three times, and the kings magically reappear at the top. And this will amaze people. Now what makes this trick so amazing is the fact that they see the kings fanned and placed on top clearly, and the fact that you leave one king over in a corner after you've supposedly placed three in the deck. The psychological impact of this trick is very strong, and I recommend it highly. If, if you only know one card trick, it should be this one. Next, I'd like to show you what's known in magic as a paddle trick, because it involves this little plastic paddle. Now, as you can see, there's a genie on the paddle, a man with a turban and a beard. And if you'll notice, this genie is on the front of the paddle and the back of the paddle, back and front. Now, what I'm going to do is make him disappear by magic, just that quick. The genie's not in the front or the back. And now what I'm going to do is make the genie appear, but only on one side of the paddle. I'll just touch the bottom. And now the genie's here, but not on the back of the paddle. And at this point, the paddle can be handed out for examination. And the audience can't figure out how you did the trick. They assume it's a trick paddle, but actually it's not. What you're doing is this. As you show the paddle from the front to the back, you turn it. So that way you keep the side that you want always facing your audience. This is all you're doing. You've got it at the tips of your fingers, and you turn it as you turn it over. That way, the one side always faces the audience. Now, to make the genie vanish, you just turn it over in your fist, and you're showing the back side. And you repeat the move. You show the front and, supposedly, the back of the paddle. 
and it looks like the genie is not there. Now, I always make the genie reappear on one side. That way I can hand the paddle out for examination, and it seems like a natural climax to the trick where there's only a genie on one side of the paddle. Now, there are a lot of different paddles on the market. One of the other most common kind is one where there's a top hat on one side and a rabbit coming out of the top hat on the other. And what happens is you show the top hat to be on both sides of the paddle, and then you make a rabbit come out of the top hat. There's all kinds of different paddle tricks. In fact, that first trick I performed with you with the six colors was performed with the paddle move. Next, I'd like to show you a trick called the Buddha Papers. There was a poor boy named Derek who lived back in the 1930s. And he worked all week, and he only made a quarter. But a magician had come through town about a week earlier and given him these magic papers that would enable him to do magic, but he only had one wish with him. So what he did was he put his little 25 cents in there because he wanted to have enough money to buy gifts for his family and friends at Christmas time. So he put his little money in the Buddha papers and he turned them over as he folded each paper. And then he held his hands on them and he wished as hard as he could. And when he opened the papers, his wish had been granted because his little 25 cents that he worked all week for had transformed into $10. And he had enough money to buy gifts for all of his family and friends. Now, as amazing as this trick seems, it's very simple to do, very simple to make. All it is is paper. And you can make it out of regular typewriter paper. It doesn't have to be multicolored like this. It could be all white. All I did was I had the $10 bill loaded in here before I showed you the trick. And the quarter is over here. See, there's a duplicate set of papers on the other side of this blue one. See? Here's where the $10 bill is, and here's where the quarter is. And that's all there is to it. Like most magic tricks, this one's simple. And there's the missing quarter. So all I did was put the quarter in, see? Just like this. And I folded the papers up. And I have to remember, you should remember too, to turn each one over as you fold it. That way when you turn this last one over, it looks natural, see? And now the trick is done because the positioning has already uh, been made. And you fold the last paper, and that's it. You just unfold them. And since the positioning has been made, when you open up the papers, the $10 bill is in position. And all it is is see a duplicate set of papers. Here's where the uh, quarter is now. And this is easy to make. You could make uh, dozens of them for maybe a dollar. And it's a lot of fun and easy to do. Now I'd like to show you something I call the spirit slates. They're little blank slates. They're small versions of the bigger slates you see in schools. And they enable the spirits to speak to us. That's why. I call them the spirit slates. Well, actually, the spirits don't speak, to be honest with you. They can't talk, but they can write. And with these slates, we're going to find out what the spirits want. But we're going to help them out by saying the magic words, which are? Hocus pocus. That's right. And now we'll see what the spirits want. Look, they want a magic show. And that's just what we're going to give them, a magic show. Now I'm going to show you a magic trick that I've had a lot of fun with over the years. I show somebody these five cards. Four of them are black, and one's the red queen. And then I turn it over, and I say, clip the queen with this clip. OK, so you see the queen's right about there. All right? So I give them the clip, and sure enough, they clip right about there. But when we turn it over, oh, they missed. They didn't get the queen. So I give them the clip back. And I show them the queen again, and I make sure they're paying attention, that they see the queen. Okay, you see it's right about there where the thumb is. So you can understand why 
they clip right there about where they saw the queen. Yet, they're wrong. They missed. So I give them the clip back. And now this time I tell them, clip anything but the queen. So what they usually do is they clip down at the very end, figuring they'll cross me up and that they'll win. And I gave them every opportunity to clip anything but the queen. But they lose because the whole thing's a queen. Just like every kid, when I was young, I got in trouble from time to time. I remember one time I got in trouble for dirtying up my dad's best pocket handkerchiefs. We were playing Indian, and we were putting makeup on and war paint and everything with lipstick and running around the house acting like a bunch of wild Indians. And we wiped it off with my dad's best pocket handkerchiefs. And look what happened. They were some kind of soiled. Look at this. And it was quarter to five, and my dad got home at five, and I realized, oh, Lord, I'm in all kinds of trouble for soiling my dad's best handkerchiefs. I've got to do something and do it fast. But I was a young magician, so I knew that magic could maybe help me. So what I did was I took the soiled handkerchiefs, and I put them in a bag along with some clothesline, because I wanted them to dry, too, not just clean, and two clothespins. And I said the magic words, which are, that's right, hocus pocus. And sure enough, instantly, the handkerchiefs were clean and dry. They came out on a clothesline, just like this, clean and dry, just as white as when my dad bought them. And of course, my magic bag that did the washing was quite empty. Recently, I was performing for a group of boys and girls, and I don't think they were as nice as you are. Because I'll tell you what happened. I showed them a box, this particular box, as a matter of fact. I showed them that it was empty. And then I showed them this yellow block right here, and I showed them that it was very solid, just a wooden block. And what I did was I put the block in the box. And then I showed them that it had vanished. It's not here. And they were all yelling for me to show them this side, so I did. And it's not here. But then they wanted to see the other side. They thought it was over here. And I showed them that it wasn't here. Then they were yelling for me to open two doors, open both doors. So I opened both doors. And they were yelling, no, no, the two front doors. So finally, that's what I did. I opened all the doors. And I took out the sides. And I showed them that the block had indeed vanished. But everything that vanishes goes somewhere. And in the case of the yellow wooden block, it's right here. You've probably heard of taking flowers and pulling them and saying, she loves me, she loves me not, to determine if a girl loves you. It's an old superstition. Well, recently there was a girl that I liked a lot, and I wanted to know if she loved me. So I took a bouquet of flowers, and I pulled each bloom off, and I said, she loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. Now, I was happy that this girl loved me, but... Now I didn't have a bouquet of flowers to give her. I just had this green bush. I had messed up the bouquet. So I had to use magic to help me. So I said the magic words, which I remember, hocus pocus. And the flowers began to bloom back, more beautiful than before, because each bloom was a different color. It was magic. Many people feel that if they were backstage at a magic show, they would see how the tricks are done. Well, let's see. I'll turn around and face an imaginary audience, which would make you backstage at my magic show, and we'll see if you can see how this trick's done. What I do is I show the front and back of a yellow piece of wood, and I place it here on this tray. I show the other yellow piece of wood front and back, and I place it on the tray. And now I show a jumbo two of spades to the audience, to my imaginary audience. 
put it between the two pieces of wood, take the wood apart, and show them that the card has vanished. But you see where it went, huh? Because you were backstage. The card's right here. Well, now I'd like to show you that trick again, but this time facing you so you can fully appreciate the trick. And you get to see what my imaginary audience saw. First, I show you the yellow pieces of wood, and I place them on the tray, front and back. And now I show you the jumbo two of spades, and I place it between the pieces of wood. And now, as you saw before, the card vanishes. Except this time, I've got to confess, I did a little magic, and the card's really gone. It's not here. It's not here. Where did it go? Everything that vanishes goes somewhere. And the card went right here. You know, magic doesn't have to be done with big props or on a large scale to be amazing. It doesn't even have to be done with special items. I'm going to do something that I think is a miracle with just a regular styrofoam cup, a pencil, and some water. Watch. I'm going to pour the water into the cup. And I've poured it like this so you can see that it went into the cup. Take the pencil, stick it in the cup, and water's gone. If you would like to learn more about magic, try your local bookstore. Most bookstores of any size have a few books on magic. If your local bookstore doesn't have what you're looking for, try your local library. Best of all, libraries are free. Ask your librarian to help you select some books on magic. She'll be glad to help you read more about the fine art of magic. Until next time, this is Joel Phantom. Bye-bye.